rise. Appreciate my reading from that text. If you haven't yet turned your Bible to Judges 17, I would encourage you to do so. We're going to be spending some time there this morning and also in chapter 18. As we think about some stories that are rarely heard, but I think they have some very valuable lessons for us. And that's what I want us to look at this morning here in just a moment. It's good to have all of you with us. We have a number of guests with us. Uh, this weekend and over the past few days, UNA has held a robotics competition and several of you uh, are a part of that and you're visiting with us this morning. You've, you, you, you've come here because that's what you normally do and that speaks volumes about you and I've been able to meet some of you, some of you I haven't, but we appreciate you being here this morning and, and hope your day continues to go well. Uh, but we have, we've had some others here this morning, about 7.30, we had a group come and, and they had their own worship period this morning and they were able to use our building and we were certainly glad that they were able to do that. I, I appreciate Doug West. Doug uh, did a lot to help with the, with the parking situation and keeping people in and keeping people out and allowing you and me to park where we normally do. And a lot of that this morning is because Doug has taken time over the past couple of days to be up here on the property just trying to manage that. And as always, I appreciate so much everything that he continues to do as he serves us and as many of you serve us in very special ways. Remember the new classes that start tonight at 5 o'clock. This is a new quarter that's beginning. That's always an exciting time. I want to thank those of you who have taught. In the past quarter, and those of you who have already begun planning and your preparation and you're beginning to teach tonight, that, that speaks volumes. And one of the great benefits of our church family, I think, is we have such, good, uh, such a good teaching program. We have people who are capable of teaching, and that, that, that goes a long way. That may, be, may, may very well be one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, about what we can do, and that's offer the gospel in its purity and its simplicity. And I appreciate those who are willing to teach. Judges 17 through 21 is the epilogue to the book of Judges. An epilogue is what happens at the end, and it's kind of a summation, if you will, of what's happened at the beginning, but it's kind of an end story to a story that's been played out prior to. Judges 1 through 16 are the stories of the judges that we're familiar with. Chapter 16 st really stops with Samson. And if you want to pick up Eli and Samuel's life, you have to go to 1 Samuel to really pick up their life. But the familiar stories of the judges for us stop in Gen Judges 16. But it is in chapter 17 that this epilogue begins. And what's interesting about the epilogue, it's primarily two basic stories but, it, but, but each of these stories are told in different segments. They're not good stories, by the way. They're, they're, they're horrible stories in some way. But I think they teach us some very valuable lessons. And that one, that's what I want us to look at this morning. I want to share the first lesson with you this morning and make some applications with you. Mike just read. I hope you followed along with that reading. Mike just read the first story that's found in these first six verses of Micah or of judges rather. I know that's pretty small, but that's the best I could do under the circumstances. So if you got somebody sitting next to you and says, has he got anything up there? Just read it to him. That'll be good. I'll try to do better as we go through there. These first six, first six verses are interesting. Micah is a man who lives in the hill country. And evidently he lives either with his mom or near his mom because this first story has to do with Micah and his mother. His mother has 1,100 shekels of silver. And she, she talks about the fact that she can't find those 1,100 shekels of silver and I guess makes her son feel so badly about it that he confesses to his mother, said, Mama, I took them. And, and, and what a good mother she is. When, she, when he confesses that he took the silver, she blesses him. Man, that's the kind of family you want to be around, right? You take money from your mother and she blesses you for it. But, but the money comes back and she takes 200 shekels of that 1,100 shekels and she has a silversmith, as Mike read for us from Judges 17, she has a silversmith who takes that and, and, and he makes an idol of silver. And so that's the, one of the first parts of this particular story. And Micah, according to verse 5, Micah's house then becomes a shrine to idols. 
And verse 6 tells us that the reason that that happened is the reason why a lot of things happen in the book of Judges, because everyone did what was right in their own eyes. If I ask you, tell me something that the book of Judges says, many of you in this audience this morning can say, well, one of the first things it says was that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And that's a phrase that's played out multiple times in this book, and it's, and it's played out here, and I think because she did and Micah did what was right in their own eyes. They, they, had, been, they had been affected by and, and almost infected by, if you will, the idol worship that had, had been part of, of where they lived. <laughs> so that was a very difficult thing. And yet they succumbed to that kind of pressure. Now, I want you to, I want you to, to take your Bible. If you, again, if you haven't, I want you to turn to Judges 17. I want to read this next section. Really, if I had the time this morning, uh, I would read all of Judges 6 or 17 and 18. But that, that would take an extensive amount of time, and I don't want to do that this morning. So, but I do want to read this next section, and then I want to tell you the story of the following section that's found in chapter 9 or 18. But beginning in verse 7, this is verse 7 of chapter 17. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah. Of the family of Judah, he was a Levite and he was staying there. And the man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the, came to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of Judah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, what do you, what do you come here? Where did you come here from? He said to him, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. It's an interesting story. This young, young Levite man who lives in Bethlehem, he leaves, he's going to try to find a little purpose. He needs to go find a job. He needs to go find some sustenance. He needs to kind of do what a lot of young people need to do. They go, need to go find, kind of find their way. So he leaves Bethlehem and he ends up at Micah's house. He's going to the hill country of Ephraim and ends up in Micah's house. And when he gets there, Micah says, what's the deal? What, what, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm just kind of looking around. I'm looking for something to do. And Micah says, well, I'm glad you came. You're a Levite. I need a priest. I think it'd be kind of neat to have a personal priest. So would you be my priest? And he says, if you will, he said, you know, I'll give you some sustenance. And I'll give you a suit of clothes and I'll give you some money. And you can just stay here and be my priest. And the young Levite says, I think that's a pretty good idea. So the young Levite stays. And verse 12 says, Micah consecrated, some of your translations say ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now that I know the Lord will be good to me, since I have a priest or Levite as priest. So these, these verses tells us what we've just read about and what I've just, uh, just mentioned to you. The young man shows up wants to be a priest, and we're familiar with that. Not all priests, well, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests, right? And this young man was a Levite, and evidently because of that, Micah thinks, you know what? Hey, he's, he's pretty good. He's at least part of it. He, he can at least be part of it, and I need a priest. So Micah encouraged him, encouraged him to come and be his priest, and the guy takes him up on it. That's chapter 17. You, you, you see kind of what's happening in this story. I mean, they, they, they're, they're trying to be godly in some sense, and, and, but yet they're not following what God wanted them to follow. But they're, but they're trying to be. There's some level of this going on. <laughs> in essence, they're doing what's right in their own eyes. Micah's doing that. This young Levite priest is doing that, but he's doing what a lot of young people do. You know, if a guy offered me a job and he's going to give me this and he's going to give me some things I'm looking for, I'm going to take him up on it. Not giving a lot of thought to what he really ought to do. And then you get to verse, or then you get to chapter 18. You get to chapter 18 and, and, and let me, instead of reading these 26 verses, let me just kind of tell you what, what's happening in these 26 verses because I think it's, it, it plays a lot with, with our story. <laughs> the Danites 
who are one of the tribes are looking for a land to dwell in. Now you might think, well, hadn't that already happened? Well, kinda. If you go back to the end of chapter one, the Danites had been looking for a land and God would have given them a land, but they didn't really take the land. It's kind of interesting. The Amorites kept them from taking their land and apparently by this time, the land taking wasn't quite what it ought to be and God was kind of saying, you know what, I, I, I wanted you to take the land. You haven't done it yet. You're going to kind of be on your own. So at the end of the book now, the Danites are looking for a land to dwell in. And as I said, they should have already had a land. So guess what they do? They send out spies to look for land. You heard about that before? That's happened before, right? Before the Israelites went in and conquered the land of Canaan, they went in and they sent spies in. Well, that's what the Danites did. They said, hey, it was good the first time, let's try it again. So they send in the spies. And the spies end up, they send out five men who are from five of the tribes. They send out these five men. And these five men end up, guess where? At Micah's house. And when they get to Micah's house, they recognize the voice of this young Levite. It's interesting. And they begin to inquire about, what, what are you doing? Why, why are you here? And he said, well, he said, I, I'm kind of like you. I was kind of wandering around. And, and I stopped by Micah's house, and Micah, has, he has hired me to be his priest. And so the spies return, and I'm leaving out a few of the details, but if you want to go back and read the details later, that would be fine. The spies return, and they tell the Danites, you know what, I, we found a place. Y'all sent us out to spy out the land to find a place, and we found a place. Matter of fact, it's such a good place, it's easy pickings. There's, they don't have any neighbors. There's nobody around them. We can take this land with, with hardly anything. Won't take anything to get it. So they go back and they report that. And so the, the Danites decide to send evidently 600 men to take an easy land. It's a little overkill. And these 600 men show up. Guess where they go? We're, go, go, we're going back to Micah's house. We, they end up at Micah's house again on their way to conquer this land. They end up at Micah's house. And while they're there, they make an offer to this Levite. It makes perfect sense. You know what? We're going to conquer a land that's pretty close to here. It's a land called Laish. We're going to change it to Dan when we get there. And they do. They change the name of Laish to Dan. But they said, when we get there, we're going to need a priest. And we've heard that you're here taking care of this guy, this one man. Why not come and take care of all of us? Well, up your salary. They didn't say that, but I'm sure that was part of the deal. Don't you imagine? Instead of taking care of one, being a priest to one person, you just come and be a priest to the whole tribe. And once again, this young Levite man thinks about that. And he thinks, well, that's a good idea. So he goes with them. And when he leaves, guess who's upset about that? Micah. And Micah rounds up his neighbors, and Micah and his neighbors go after the Levite. And, 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 and they have this conversation, this exchange about, well, what, where are you going? Why are you doing that? And the Levite says, well, they, you know, they've offered me a pretty good deal. I think that's what I need to do. And, and, the, and Micah realizes, hey, I'm, I'm not going to get what I want. I'm not going to get him to come. So he just basically lets him go, and Micah goes back home. That's most of chapter 18. But then, when you get to verse 27, the story takes a pretty major turn. That's where I want you to pay attention with me this morning. When you get to chapter 18, verse 27. So notice, notice what the text says. So they took the things that Micah had made. That's the Danites. And the priest who had belonged to him and went to Laish to a people quiet and secure and they struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. They took their priest, they went to the city and just shut it down. They burned it to the ground. Said, it's ours. Verse 28, there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon and they had no ties with anyone. These people who had lived there, it, it was out in the bushes. They didn't have any ties with anyone. What could they do? Somebody's going to take over so they took over. 
It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. So they rebuilt the city and dwelt there. And they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born to Israel. However, the name of the city formerly was Laish. Now that's, that's kind of the end of that particular story, except what we're about to read is really a key. It, but but it's, it's a rarely, I think it's a rarely talked about key. And I want to share that with you this morning because I think it, I think it shows such an important lesson for us. And I want us to look at that this morning. In verse 30 of this text, which we stopped before I got to, notice what this says. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image. <laughs> and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Did you get that? Did you follow that? Is there anything about what I just read, particularly in verse 20, that staggers your mind? We're going to look at that in just a moment. But let's talk about one of the issues. The reason that what we're about to see happen is because of what is talked about in Judges 2. When Joshua dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. But now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 and they buried him within the inheritance of Timnah in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. And when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. What we're about to read from verse 30 of Judges 18 is what this passage is telling us. We're about to read an example. And it is an example that the, that the Jewish people hate. But it's the reality. Let me just make a kind of a point parenthetically before I move on, because I'm, I'm going to say something about this here in a moment. It's hard for faith to go from generation to generation. It's hard. <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to talk about that. Let me just stop and say something to you about this particular lesson. I feel compelled almost monthly to preach something that has to do with faith being passed on. I think about it an awful lot, and I probably don't preach on it as much as I probably should, but I will tell you I think about it. And the reason I do is because I see all these kids. Not just kids. But I see all, all, all the generations who are part of this particular group or the generations who may not be in this auditorium this morning, but who are in other places. But yet, I, I know that, that all of us, if not most of us at least, are people of faith who are interested in passing faith on to, gener to, our next, to the next generation. And, 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 that, and I use that term, and there's a lot involved in that term. But you know what I'm talking about. And I feel obligated. And I think I should. And, and I hope I do try to share some thoughts with you that, ha that help parents, especially, but anybody, any of us who, who are trying to figure out what our faith ought to be about. But it's hard. And I think it's becoming increasingly hard, quite frankly, to pass faith from one generation to the next. And even in this audience, there is a variety of things that have happened with generation from generation to generation in terms of faith. There's just, it's just mixed. It's the way that is. But it's always been that way. It's always been 
that way. And it's because of how hard it is. Which tells you how difficult it can be to help try to make it happen. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort to do that. And so this is the problem. I want to give you an example. And, and I want to share with you why the Israelites and the Jews, even today, they don't, they don't like what's stated next. Because what's stated in verse 30 is this, then the children of Dan set up for themselves a carved image. And Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. But some of your translations don't have the word Manasseh. Some of your translations have the word Moses. The young Levite who wasn't named in Judges 17 and most of 18. You ready for this? He's Moses' grandson. We're talking, we're talking Moses. We're talking about the man who went up the mountain and got the, got the commandments from the Lord. We're talking about the deliverer of Egypt. We're talking about him. It's his grandson. It's his grandson that we're talking about. A Levite who has become first Micah's priest, now he's become priest of a whole tribe, and now it's not only his, his, that, my, that Jonathan's doing it, but his sons. He, he's, he helped his sons be priests. Did you see that? And his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now you know the rest of the story, right? Now you got a little Paul Harvey going on today. Only a few of you know who I'm talking about. Now you get the rest of the story. And it's not a story that, that the Jews like. And I understand that. The story horrified the Jews. And, and, and you know, the Jews needed to save face. Let, let me show you what's happened. This is interesting. This is what, a, this, this text in the Hebrew Bible looks like this. And what's circled in red, I took a picture of this and then I put it on this chart. But what's circled in red there is the Hebrew Bible. And what they've done is that they have put, and, and I, you know, you know I, don't, I know very little about Hebrew, but some of these little marks at the top of this change this word from Moses to Manasseh. Now in English, Moses looks quite different than Manasseh, right? In English. But this is not English. This is Hebrew. And it takes the changing of the letter N to change it from Moses to Manasseh. Why would they do that? Save face. Isn't that interesting? Because we don't want anybody to know that Moses' own grandson was involved in this kind of things. They became priests when they had no right to be priests. And Jonathan apparently was the ringleader. His own grandson was the ringleader. And notice what happened. You remember what the text tells us? They were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. I mean, that, that, had, that one was ongoing. It's Moses' grandson. Let that just sink in for a minute. You know, you, you and I, would, we would understand that the importance of Moses among the Jewish people. He's one to let them out of captivity. Moses let them out of captivity. So, so we understand the value that, and, and, and only two generations passed, his grandson becomes the priest to a tribe that, that has basically abandoned God altogether. What do you take away from that? Let, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about that. What do you take away from that? 
I'll tell you the first thing I'll take. I just, I, just want, I just want to mention basically two things. First of all, that culture is a powerful force on people. Culture is a powerful force on people. All sorts of ways to talk about that this morning. All sorts of ways. And if I just said to you, okay, just stop for a moment and think about the ways in which culture has affected you personally. My guess is, like me, there's all sorts of places you can go and all sorts of places you can land and say, it's affected me this way, it's affected me that way. Because it's a strong, it's a powerful force. And mamas and daddies, you're dealing with it. You're dealing with it for yourselves first, and you're, 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 then you're dealing with it for your own kids. Don't you think for a minute that it doesn't affect them? Because it does. And, and don't any of us think for a minute it doesn't affect us because it does. Why? Because it's a powerful force. Because it's hard to move from one generation to another and it be what it ought to be. That's hard to do. Moses had a choice to make. We remember this. You got to see this. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, he refused to act upon his Egyptian culture. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. What is that saying? He didn't follow Egyptian culture. He didn't even want to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't even want that title. He could have had it because that's really what he was, but he didn't want that title. He wasn't that biologically, but socially, and ethnically, in, in a lot of ways, he was already that. But he didn't want to be called that. He could have had every treasure in Egypt, and he didn't want that. Now, that, that, you talk about a powerful decision, my friend. That, that is a powerful decision. That's a good choice, right? Moses made a good choice. I'll tell you who didn't make a good choice. His grandson. His grandson didn't make a good choice. You know what I could say today? There's some of you sitting in this audience this morning. I could say, you've made good choices. But your grandson hasn't. Or your son hasn't. That's the way life is. It, it's a choice. It's a choice that people make. And it's a choice people make because every person has the choice to make. Every person has the choice. Free will is a part of life for everybody, whether we like it or not. As a parent, do I want all my, my kids to have free will? Yes and no. Maybe to a point, but I'd like them to pay attention to what daddy thinks and what daddy says. And to some degree, and most all degree, they have. I mean, I, I'm thankful for that. But you know what? I, I'd like to have my thumb be a little bit heavier on the scale sometime, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to have a little extra influence over them? Well, you can, possibly, and, but sometimes you can't. And when you can't, then you just press on. I don't know if Moses, we use the term rolling over in his grave, but don't you imagine if he could have rolled over, he would have rolled over if he'd known what was going on. Jonathan, Gershom's son, is being, is being a prophet and being a priest to a group of people who have abandoned me altogether? That's my grandson? Yep. That's your grandson. Well, let me, let me, remind, let me remind you just a couple of things in reference to this. Th this, kind of, this kind of teaching starts at home. It doesn't start here. It doesn't start here. It may, it, it may begin here with bringing your kids before they even know what's going on. And I think that's great. I think that should be the case. But they're not going to learn about God first here. If they do, that's sad. They're going to first learn about God with you putting them, pulling them out of that crib 
and reading those books and reading those Bible and reading those Bible stories, that's where they're going to learn about it. It starts there. So don't think that it starts with the elders or the teachers or the preacher. We're, we're certainly, we, we certainly want to help. It, it, part of our responsibility is to help, but it's not to start. And it's not ever to be the focal point, I don't think. I don't think there's any point in time when I take the place of you as a parent in terms of, of your child's Bible training. If, if that's the case, then good luck. But don't let me take the place of that. And don't let what they get in Bible classes here take the place of what they ought to get from you. Don't let that happen. It starts at home. Train up a child in the way he should go. Bring up a child. Raise a child. And I will continue to remind all of us, hopefully on a regular basis, about that. Because I do think that's important, especially here at this time in this place. I think that's important. Let me say another thing about culture. You need to learn to tell your children no and mean it. Listen carefully. In my judgment, this, this is my judgment, but I think there are biblical principles that would state this. We need to tell our kids no. When it comes to things that culture is, is pushing on them, we need to be able to say no. You can't go there. You can't do that. You can't say that. You can't wear that. You can't be that. Because that's what culture wants you to do. And we're not a part of that culture. We're not a part of that culture. You don't need to be a part of that culture. Part of my responsibility as your dad and as your mother or as your grandmother or grandfather is to tell you, no, you don't need to be a part of that. And when I say no, I mean no. I asked him, well, I've told you all this. I asked a woman one time who was a dear friend of mine. I said, give me the best advice you could ever give me for helping raise kids. She said, I got it. I got it for you. She said, tell your kids yes as much as you can. But when you say no, you mean it. Don't back off of it. Don't back off of it. Do not back off of it. I've raised three kids. I had, I had this much to do with it. My wife did most of it. And it was hard. And there's times when it still is hard when they want information or they want advice. You know what's even harder? Y'all know this. It's, it's when you want to give them advice and they don't want the advice, right? You have to be careful about putting your thumb on that scale again. But May I just say this to you? I think this, I think this is some of the best thing I could pass on. Say yes when you can, but mean no when you have to say it. Do not back off. Do not back away. Do it because it's the right thing to do and because you don't want them to be a part of this culture. That's the hard part. It's hard not being a part of the culture. It was hard, my guess is, for Moses to say, you know what, I don't want those treasures. Don't you, don't you imagine that he could have had a lot more in his life if he would have said, you know, I'm Pharaoh's, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't want to be called that. He didn't want that. Because that would have put him in a place where he didn't want to be. And let me add something to this. Sometimes these, these choices are not between what's right and wrong. Sometimes they're between what will draw a person closer to God or what will draw a person further away from God. You've you got you to help them with that. Say no to things that you know for a fact are going to draw people away from God. They may not be inherently bad things, but you know to be a part of that and to be involved with that, that's not what they need. That's not going to help them to go to heaven. It's going to help them start going to hell. And you don't want that. You don't want that for them, do you? I know you don't. I know you don't want that. So, so help them by saying, no, we're not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not, how about this? I'm not going to let you do that. What? What? I'm not going to let you do that. Now, 
you know, being a Christian is not just being nice and doing nice things for people. We, we've almost reached a point in our world where people think being a Christian is just be nice to people. Don't hurt anybody and be nice. You know what? You don't have to have Jesus and not hurt anybody and be nice. Jesus is not going to help anybody do that any more than not having him. You can just inherently know, I ought to be nice to people because I want people to be nice to me. But there are some things that need to happen and there are some things that don't need to happen. And we need to be people who clearly see those things and help do them ourselves and help our children do them and help our grandchildren do them. That's, that's a big statement and I get that. And there's a whole lot involved in it. And I get that. But I said what I wanted to say and, 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 and I, that's what I want to say to you. But, but I really, I would encourage you to hear all that and apply all that. And then let me say this in closing. Here, here's the other issue. You know what this story teaches me? Is that there are false religions. There are false doctrines. There are false teachers. There are people who are out there and we ought to be careful that those people aren't in here. And that requires an amount of study, an amount of interest, an amount of knowledge, an amount of, of analyzation, and an amount of conclusion. That involves all of us being involved first in our lives to try to figure those things out. And then it, it becomes something that we ought to be involved with because of our children, for our children's sake, or our friend's sake, or, or, or our brothers and sisters who are part of this. Because there are false religions. And don't, don't get caught up in the fact that, well, you know, I don't know, you know, about it. Okay. There are false religions. There, there were then. And there were false doctrines that were being taught. And there were false teachers who were teaching those false doctrines who were part of those false religions. And the way we overcome that is we do the best we can to read and evaluate and conclude correctly as well as we can and we keep searching and we keep finding and we keep working at it trying to reach those conclusions and trying to apply those conclusions to our lives that's what we need to do that's what we need to teach our children to do I believe that's what we teach our children in these classes that we have for them here to do. And I hope we do the same thing in our adult classes. We're, we're trying to teach people to study for themselves, to reach conclusions for themselves, to reach the right conclusions for themselves. But those are two lessons that I think are real important from stories that we don't read much about. From, from the grandson of Moses. He, 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 culture ate him up. So he didn't care about, he didn't care about Jesus. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about the things that, that his grandfather would have, would have told him about. He didn't care about that evidently. And so he, he was led away. And he led his own sons away into those kinds of things. Well, there's, a lot, there's a lot more I could say. But you probably want to go eat lunch and supper. So I'm going to stop. But, but I, I hope you'll hear that. I hope, I hope you'll hear, think about Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, the son of Moses. And let that affect you and, and, and how you treat people of your own family. If you're in this audience this morning and you are not a Christian, we would encourage you to become one. We always... At this service, we always offer an invitation of the Lord. We do that in a, a, a more of a public kind of way because we want people to know that we're here to help with the needs of people who have a spiritual need, and that's where we would focus that attention at this time. So if you have a spiritual need that we can help you with, and by that I mean uh, either establishing a relationship with the Lord or reestablishing your relationship with the Lord, we'd love to help you do that to whatever degree we can. But you'll need to make that known to us. And one way to do that would be to come forward while we stand and while we sing.